Hello, everyone. My name is Yi Chun Zhang. My web name is Agent of the Age, and I'm currently working for Cloudflare's uh, systems engineer. I'm very excited to speak here, and it's a big room. I think the last talk is mine, which probably means we don't have a time limit, right? <laughs> I, I have prepared a lot of slides. OK, so OpenSD was created like nine years ago in the year 2007. I am the creator of OpenSD, and I'm currently the maintainer. We have a, an official development team working on OpenSD's new features and bug fixes. And we also have mailing lists, a relatively big community. We have both a Chinese mailing list and an English mailing list. And we also have a Twitter account, also called OpenSD. So the core of the OpenSD is the NGX Lua module. We provide various different kinds of NGX configuration directives that allow you to hook, hook your Lua code into different places of the NGX core, like the rewrite phase, like body filter content by. I think most of you may have already been familiar with those things. And also, over the years, we have accumulated many you know, Lua libraries designed specifically for OpenSD. So OpenSD is essentially embedding Lua JIT into NGX. And we have all the non-blocking I.O abstractions that can help you build very complicated web applications. So these libraries provide you, for example, MySQL clients and PostgreSQL, MongoDB, RabbitMQ, and also health checkers for NGX upstreams, many, many things. Yeah, we really appreciate our growing community. Yeah, so OpenSD is essentially NGX plus Lugit, but we also invented a lot of you know, our own abstractions, like light threads and timers, thanks to Lua's coroutines support. So the OpenSD world encourages the all-inclusive philosophy. So many of our users come from different open source communities like Ruby, Java, PHP, Node.js, and even Go, and Java, of course. And NGX sits in a very interesting place that you can do very interesting things in the middle, like between your backends and your customers. So it's possible for OpenSD users to use a hybrid solutions. Many of users you know, combine OpenSD with more traditional stack, technical stacks. So the goals of OpenSD is simple, being very simple and very small in terms of memory usage and code base size. And also, it should be very fast. We chose Lua because of its very good implementations. So to tell the truth, I started learning Lua after I working on the NGX Lua module, <laughs> so I, did, I, I knew very little about Lua before. So the choice of Lua is very pragmatic, and also it should be flexible. The goal is to support very complicated, large-scale web applications atop OpenSD alone, though many users still use hybrid solutions. We also encourage that. We love choices. And the key of the OpenSD's I.O. model is synchronously non-blocking. I know the word asynchronous is you know, maybe too, too ubiquitous. But I think human minds think asynchronously, not asynchronously. I hate callbacks, um, obviously. So we invented light threads and semaphores to um, emulate concurrency, but with only one single operating system thread. 
and we invented cold sockets. It's just like traditional BSD sockets or Lua sockets, but it's completely non-blocking. You just use it to write code, just like in PHP or any other languages. And we also have timers and sleeping primitives. So you can still have asynchronous threads running in the background, a background detached from any down, uh, downstream requests handled by Nginx. It's like cron jobs, right? And we also have shared memory-based dictionaries and queues, which expose very nice Lua APIs to, to, to the Lua code. And all these things are based on the Nginx infrastructure. So why share memory? Basically, we want to share data among all the Nginx worker processes. And we also support dynamic SSL handshake for downstream HTTPS traffic just in the most recent few, few months. And for example, at Cloudflare, we, we, uh, we are a CDN provider, right? And we have a lot of customers, a lot of virtual servers. And we also have a lot of edge servers consisting of our network. And one problem is too many SSL certificates and private keys. So to solve that problem, we can load the certificates and private keys on demand only when the real traffic asks for it. This way, we can theoretically support unlimited set of certificates and private keys, because uh, thanks to the locality of the traffic, because there's no way for a single machine to see all the possible customer traffic, right? And also with OpenSD, we can cache the certificates and private keys inside Nginx, both in shared memory and also on the worker process level. And the data, like certificates, are distributed via Qt Tycoon at Cloudflare uh, at the moment. But other choices are also possible, like Redis or some other distributed data storage we'll talk about very soon. And we also support dynamic load balancers in Lua in Nginx. For example, in the traditional upstream configuration block, you can use a, you use a few lines of Lua code to define your own complicated dynamic balancers. Dynamic means that you can use different balancing policy upon every individual request on that level. So it's extremely flexible. And you can also introduce um, retry policies as well. For example, when a particular peer selected fails a request, you can choose the next. And how to choose the request and whether to retry is all up to you. Uh, you have complete control in Balancer by Lua. Yeah. And with this, um, standard NGX modules like proxy, like FastCGI, UWSGI, all work out of the box. So that's the goal. And also the Keep Alive module, the connection pool module provided by NGX Core should also work out of the box. And just recently, I also created the, another Lua module, NGX Stream Lua module. The previous one, the more common one, is NGX HTTP Lua module. So for stream Lua module, it utilizes the new stream subsystem in the NGX core, which makes it possible to implement generic TCP servers and UDP servers. Uh, speaking of which, the official openresty.org website, its DNS server is powered by this module. Yeah, the authoritative DNS server. And also, I see people use this module to write generic TCP uh, daemons like syslog to accept a lot of you know, online log data streams. Over the years, we also accumulated a lot of you know, advanced debugging and profiling tools, that m uh, most of which can be used safely online. Because you know, at Cloudflare, we have a large global network, and Things can go wrong, right? And sometimes bad things can only happen 
at a very low um, percentage, like 1% or even 0.1 or 0.001%. So to troubleshoot such um, problems that are almost impossible to reproduce, we need advanced debugging tools. So we open sourced most of our tools based on GDB and system tab. GDB is mostly for you know, debugging dead processes, like analyzing code dumps. We used to you know, use this approach, use GDB and Codum to uh, help Mike Paul nail down like 10 very deep bugs in the just-in-time compiler of Luajit, uh, which, are, which were hidden for years. And for system tabs, it's the dynamic tracing framework um, provided by a bunch of very uh, smart Red Hat developers, kernel developers, and it allows you to, you know, analyze running systems, the whole software stack, from the kernel to NX to your application, Lua scripts, the whole stack on the fly uh, with minimal impact on the production server. So you don't have to you know, uh, drop the box or set up, a, set up a firewall. You can do the live analysis. So I think there's a future of the systems engineering. Um, in recent months, we introduced several you know, important features that can that make it possible for OpenSD-based applications to handle this much concurrency level um, in a single production box. It's like two million concurrent connections. And we, some of our user companies do run such push systems online. Um, Another very interesting use case is uh, web API and microservices. Many people use OpenSD to build such things, um, like Mashape's Corn platform and Adobe's API gateways for their cloud traffic. And also some United States banks use OpenSD to route their traffic, application traffic. So there, and also there are some you know, very big Chinese internet companies use OpenSD to build real-time star market information services. And those interfaces are among their busiest interfaces, obviously, and also weather information, real-time weather information interfaces. So uh, the possibilities are unlimited. Another very common use case of OpenSD is web gateways. Like many CDN vendors use OpenSD, at least in the middle. And we also have you know, uh, people using OpenSD to run HTTP or gen generic TCP or UDP traffic. So Lua makes it possible to script your gateways on the fly because of the dynamic nature of the internet. Modern CDM vendors have to handle many different customers, and the customer's requirements are more and more complicated. Some of the logic are even from their applications, and they want to run their business, some of the business logic on the edge. It's very common. And also, they want the capability to change the configurations at real time, at least soft real time. They wa people want such capabilities. So the choice of Lua makes it possible because we can use Lua just in time to just in time the code, depending on the new configurations or new traffic load patterns, right? So that's the beauty of just in time because it uses profiling information to guide its, uh, the code's compilation and use different optimizations based on the load patterns. That's exactly what we want, right? Um, NGX does support hop reload, right? Reloading configurations based on hop signal, but it's way too expensive for CDM vendors. And it's, uh, it's not an option because you have to, you know, gracefully quitting all your worker processes and start a bunch of new ones, and the cache might be cold, and I mean the code cache, and sometimes the data cache, right? It's, it's just too much impact for a single customer's change to all the other customers. 
Okay, so the original uh, design goal of OpenSD is to support web applications, full-fledged web applications. My first imaginary you know, use case is to build a personal blog of my own. <laughs> so I created OpenSD. Um, nowadays, there are many you know, e-commerce websites and some ad provi providers and also some more traditional websites use OpenSD to build the full-fledged web applications from scratch. For example, this JD.com, Jingdong, is a very, one of the largest B2C e-commerce websites in China. And their websites usually have a huge amount of traffic on the, the big marketing days, like, like Black, Black Fridays in the United States, but it's November the 11th in China. And they originally started with .NET, the .NET technology, and their services crashed horribly. And then they migrated to Java, and, and again, the service crashed. Eventually, they migrate to, oh, jeez. <laughs> Eventually, they migrated to OpenSD. They still have some you know, Java asynchronously in the back end, but it's all OpenSD in the front to handle the, all the raw the tra traffic. And they couldn't be happier. <laughs> no incidents since then. And they used OpenSD to generate the most complicated um, web page of their websites. For example, this is an iPhone product page. It's a product de details page. And it, such pages extract most of their traffic. And they, they use OpenSD's template, a template li library to generate the HTML. Very long page. Here I can only show the top of it. A very long page, very large HTML pages with Lua, Lua templates. And they use Redis to avoid the downstream request hitting their Java backends directly. So this model works pretty well for them. And I asked whether I could optimize their systems for them, and they replied that their systems already running so fast that they didn't bother optimizing it anymore. And we also have a new OpenSD website. This site was just rewritten in Lua atop OpenSD from scratch. And the whole application is in Lua, and we talked to PostgreSQL the database directory, non-blocking. NX event model handles all the I.O. events for us. It's very cheap and it's blazingly fast. We also support inside search, thanks to PostgreSQL's Protect Search Index support. OK, so to my surprise, some of my cust uh, users use OpenST to build distributed storage systems. I, I really didn't expect that. And actually, it's also one of the biggest uh, web portal websites in China. <laughs> uh, it's called Singer, S-I-N-A. Some of you might have heard. And there are some very interesting products. It's, yeah, it's like Dropbox or something. Yeah. And they not only use OpenSD for the front end, they also use it for the back end, handling file I.O. directly. And they were pretty happy with that. And one of their core developers has become a, a contributor of OpenSD. Another thing that the community is contributing is DataNet. I think it's the first public announcement of it. <laughs> but it's not open source yet. We're still you know, working on it and testing it. The author of DataNet is uh, Russell. So this is his Twitter handle. You can add him and say hi. And he's, he's building a distributed data network atop OpenSD, mostly. So a setting point of this thing is that it uses CRDT, conflict-free replicate data types. Frankly, I, I know nothing about this. <laughs> yeah, it's very complicated algorithms distributed for distributed systems. And the papers are very hard to learn, but it, the result is wonderful. 
Basically, uh, you can form a stateful network. Each node in your network can have state, and they can make changes or creating new data, and the changes and the creation will populate to the other nodes in a similar P2P fashion. And the, the, latency, the low latency is guaranteed to some point. And I say that's a similar P2P, right? Um, why is that? Because it has, you have some kind of central, but it's a mesh of central clusters. It could be just a few big data centers, and all other pops or mini pops can you know, sign up to the central network, and all the nodes form a stateful network. It can be geographically large. Also, some of the agents may go offline temporarily, and they can accumulate local changes, and once they come up online, their accumulated local changes can populate as soon as possible. OK, so I, I won't talk more about that because it deserves another hour or two. OK, as regex, we have the, I've been building my own regular expression engine, not just for fun, but also for real business requirements. It's called S regex. Basically, it supports streaming processing. Uh, the web server should handle very large data streams or theoretically infinite data streams. So the key is to use a constant buffer, a buffer with a barn, uh, often a very small barn, like 4K or something. So when data come in, we process it, we get what we want, we make our decisions, like we drop it or we let it through, right? But everything should work in a one-way fashion that once a data chunk is processed, it's history, because the buffer is refueled by the next data chunk, right? So the idea is very intriguing, but the algorithms can be very difficult, because um, many traditional algorithms just won't work, like the backtracking algorithms very popular in mainstream regular expression engines. Basically, when you find something, uh, you may when you fail to find some, some match, you may have to move the string pointer backward to, to retry, right? So this is a backtracking algorithm. Like PCRE, like many other regular expression engines use the backtracking uh, algorithm. It has many problems, not just uh, you know, using a fixed buffer. It also can lead to you know, exponentially expensive behavior. We call it pathological behavior. Um, so I created a DFA engine for Asterix. The performance benchmark looks pretty you know, promising. You see the orange part? That is Google 3.2. And the purple one is PCRE JIT. And the black one is PCRE interpreter. And the green one is PCRE2 interpreter. And the blue one is PCRE2 just in time. So PCRE is a very popular C library for supporting per compatible regular expressions. And it also comes with a very nice just in time compiler. So for this case, read 2 plays really bad. But the backtracking engine plays well, especially the JIT one, right? And we, as regex, the yellow one is comparable. And for this use test case, we can see that the read 2 plays better than PCRE, and especially better than the interpreter, but we are a little bit even better. And for this very simple regular expression, d dot star question mark d, we, we, we win by a very wide margin, right? Because the DFE engine can disambiguate things and do very clever optimizations. Uh, this use case is from PCRE's benchmark test suite. And also, we are a bit, bit better. 
the yellow one. And this record expression is extracted from model security's uh, core rule set for, for web application firewall filtering. And it, it, the, the backtracking engine plays really bad. It consumes a lot of CPU time because of backtracking. And SRegix DFA engine is, is wonderful. It processes very fast and without looking backwards, just going straight ahead. Yeah, so SRegix will be the next big thing of our RSC. What you are seeing is not a production-ready thing. It's just a quick prototype written in Pro. So I used like 2,000 lines of Pro to, to write a regular expression engine compiler that can generate C code. And the resulting C code is you know, compiled by Kalan or GCC. So I cheated a bit, just a proof of concept. I think my just-in-time compiler can do better than Clan and GCC because their optimizers are way more generic. So they, for example, Clan's register coalescing algorithms may you know, suck for the state of machine code. Um, OK, so back to our main topic. We are talking about DSLs built atop OpenSD, right? <laughs> yeah, and we, we've been talking about many OpenSD features, some of which are very new. And my point is that OpenSD can be used as a virtual machine, just like JVM, right? But it can be way more, more powerful and more web-oriented. The experiment was actually done like six to seven years ago. It's nothing new, but, uh, but I love experimenting. When I, wor when I worked for Taobao, uh, one of the largest C2C e-commerce websites in China, which is a sub-company of the Alibaba group. I think most of you should have heard Alibaba, right? And I worked for the data analytics product of Taobao, whose customers are Taobao's merchants, like eBay's merchants or sellers, right? And they want a data analytics product to analyze their traffic to their shops, and also their effects of ad deployment, as well as their sales, right? So it's a big product. It was the homepage of that website, that, that product. It calls, it's called Liangz, or Quantum. So we have a lot of you know, nifty charts, just like Google Analytics, right? But we have so many different reports. And this, this is the uh, data reports. The data volume is huge because of the size of the Taobao. And I experimented on the client side, the you know, rich internet application approach. Basically, it's like seven years ago. Basically, the, the whole website, whole application logic is written in JavaScript, running in the web browser like Gmail, right? Um, we also introduced a client-side templates. So we have a compiler that can generate JavaScript code from template files. We'll talk about that later. And also we have you know, um, web services to drive the client-side applications. So web services is the key. It's the only thing that runs on the server side. The web service uh, emits JSON data to the client, and JavaScript renders the pages or page regions using the compiled version of the templates. Uh, the whole server-side architecture of that data analytics product was like this. Basically, OpenSC sits at the center between our backends and the web browsers of our customers, and the backends consists of a huge MySQL cluster, because data volume is so large. It's like uh, almost 100 nodes. And also, there's a real-time statistics cluster to provide you know, real-time statistics. And also, there's Taobao's open platform, which is an open API uh, that emits JSON. <laughs> and we also have a Mem Memcached cluster and Tokyo Tyrant cluster for other metadata. So 
it's very simple than the previous version because the previous version used PHP to run the whole product. And I quickly realized the problem. I didn't have enough men. I only have two intern students and myself. That's my whole team, but we have to migrate the whole data analytics product written in PHP over to the new OpenRSD platform, at which time OpenRSD was also still very young. And I forced my stu intern students to write in Lua directly, but the business log is so complicated because, because of all the different dimensions of the business logic in Taobao and the very crazy you know, business requirements. So I thought, thought about that hard through night, and I invented a DSL domain-specific language for the whole system because I understand the core pattern or model of the data analytical product. And to leverage that understanding, we can provide a natural way to, to express our business logic to the machines. So think about it. What is programming? So programming is essentially um, an activity to communicate with machines, right? To make machines understand your intentions and run your business fast, cheaply, and reliably. So the key is to increase the efficiency to communicate with machines. If you can use like two words or two sentences to convey an idea, then there's no need to use like 10,000 lines of code, right? That's crazy. I'm, for example, I'm not a big fan of Java, yeah, obviously, <laughs> because there's so, so, so much code. And for this case, Lua is not up to the task. Neither is, you know, other similarly imperative languages. So I invented my own language, my own way to convey the idea to the machine. It's based on SQL, why? Because data analytics products are essentially you know, based on the relational model, no matter whether you are using a SQL databases, right? And we can de define variables and user variables in SQL, they are first class citizens, right? And the SQL can be run remotely on some MySQL backends, or it can run in place, inside NGX. So I implemented a SQL engine in memory database just with uh, hundreds of lines of Lua. It works pretty well. And the complexity comes that the data needs to be fetched from many you know, different MySQL databases. And then we need to mush up the data relationally in memory, and then assemble the final result set and emit it to the client. And there are many tricky parts in it because you have to, you know, discompose a single SQL query and run it on many different nodes. And you also need to, you know, optimize the SQL queries automatically because uh, the MySQL's optimizer cannot do a lot of, you know, optimizations, especially for um, OLAP kind of applications. So essentially, we are writing the business logic in all these SQL files, and we use compilers to generate Lua code. Um, and it's eventually, we publish our Lua code online without the compiler. That's the beauty of compilation. So basically, on the command line, we, we invoke the compiler to uh, compile the L SQL files, and then we link it to the formal, the final Lua application. The result is very impressive because the compiler can do a lot of optimizations that a human cannot normally do, or act, at least cannot do properly, correctly. Um, the old API is, uh, was written in PHP, and the new API was you know, generated Lua code from my compilers, and the latency dropped a lot. It's like 90% or something, including my, uh, my SQL latency here. It's a whole AP API um, HTTP latency. One caveat here is that we are using the standard Lua interpreter. We shall see in the next chart, uh, switching to LuaJIT gives a nice speed up further. 
But still, this, uh, in this chart, the Lua JIT is still using the interpreter only, not the just-in-time compiler. OK, so the compiler was written in just 4,000 lines of Pro. Not much, but it has very complicated optimizations and type check, checking, and, and everything, and other context-sensitive you know, analysis. Basically, the compiler composes of a parser, an AST, an abstract syntax tree, and some optimizers and a code emitter. Actually, it has several code emitters because it supports multiple backends. Yeah, we can generate low code, but why not C code? We can also generate C code, right? So if you, remember, if you recall that we actually, one of our backends is a real-time data, uh, database, right? So it, it's, it provides a very specific and complicated wire protocol, which is very hard to you know, manually craft a client for it. So I, I've got an idea, because this thing has very nice documentation, a wiki page. So why not let the machine understand the wiki documentation page and generate an NXT module for, for us, right? <laughs> so that, that idea comes into my mind. And I quickly did an implementation. So basically, I abstract the wiki documentation with a very small DSL, because the wiki you know, is not very precise, but it's very similar to the original wiki page. And then I wrote a very quick pro script to understand that and compile it to a complete NGXC module that can talk to the real-time database non-blockingly. It's an NGX upstream module. You can see that the, docu the documentation is just like 300 lines of code, but the resulting C, code, uh, C module code is uh, more than 12,000. So from this example, we can see that programming is about communication with machines. So if a documentation is already you know, concise and precise enough, then we can feed that to the machines directly with some guidance, maybe. That can save all the headache of programming and implementations. So all this falls into the um, sentence, I'd rather write programs, you write programs, you write programs. <laughs> so our test scaffold is also based on DSLs, right? For example, we have a specification like um, language syntax to describe test cases. So this test NGX socket is used by all the OpenSD projects. So it doesn't matter if you don't know Pro because we are not, you know, asking you to use Pro. We, we provide a specification. Uh, services can also be tested in a, in a similar way. And oh, next big thing. So how about tests? For new products, there's no data, right? There's no data in the databases, but we have to test our SQL queries, our web pages, our services. So I wrote a DSL that looks very similar to the SQL create table uh, statements. So it's called cheater. Basically, you specify regular expressions for allowed value ranges for a table column, and also specify the foreign key constraints between uh, database tables. And then this tool will generate random data that satisfy all your constraints and requirements. Um, OK, so back to OpenSD. What we can learn from my <laughs> six years ago experiment? Basically, we can design and provide a model language that you know, do, do something similar, that you can use SQL in OpenSD. And the compiler can figure out whether to make the running remotely or running locally to do the mashup, or decompose SQL through running, run, running the, the query up, up among many different databases, not necessarily relational databases, right? And also, there's an OpenSD view language, the MVC 
pa paradigm. And for Vue, we have template languages. For example, Perl's TT2 templating language is a, it's my favorite. And Python has got Ginger 2, for example. And such DSLs can be compiled into client-side JavaScript or server-side Lua code. That's the beauty of DSLs. For example, we already have Gemplate to compile Perl's CT2 template language into client-side JavaScript code and Lamplate for compiling down to OpenSD Lua code. And the controller language is also a big thing. Um, it looks like this. Basically, we, it's a rule-based language. You specify a bunch of rules, and the, arrow, the, the left-hand side of the arrow, arrows are uh, predicates, like conditions. And the right-hand side of the arrows are actions, which make side effects, like perform a redirect or returning an error page. Right? And the predicates are side effect free which is mandatory. This makes the compiler um, capable of you know, doing some very aggressive optimizations, like combining those predicates out of order and scanning, for example, the URL just for once and get, getting results of multiple regular expressions. To look at it, most of the CDN business logic can be conveyed in this way. This is the essence of the CDN business models. So different business models share some kind of you know, um, intrinsic properties or models. It's, it can be may, maybe formalized. For example, data analytics products share a common relational model. It's a relational uh, arithmetic, right? <laughs> and SQL happens to be a good way to convey that idea. And for CDN or gateway-like or WAF-like business systems, I think the model is a rule-based model. And it's, theoretically, it's a forward chain expert system model. So I, I'm a big fan of artificial intelligence. And in high school, I learned pretty a lot myself about ver various different kinds of AR branches. And nowadays, machine learning is so hot, right? But actually, I think another branch, the expert system branch, can also be of great use in software engineering. Uh, this is an example, I think. The, the syntax is based on the prolog language, which is very popular in natural language processing. And the semantics is based on clips. It's, it's a sys public domain system provided by uh, developed by NASA uh, a few decades ago, in 1970s, maybe. OK, so we also can have you know, out response filters, which supports record expressions, multiple record expressions to do complicated you know, substitutions, um, all in NX output filters. So it's also non-buffered. So constant buffer, infinite data stream processing. That's pretty cool, right? So this example shows how to correctly remove all the C++ comments from C++ source code. You can, you, you can change this example to support, for example, CSS minification, right? And JavaScript minification, right? So it will be based on SRGIX for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, WAF. WAF is pretty hot. And NGX company is also you know, launching a more security port for NGX, right? And uh, in my opinion, WAF can be based on the controller language I just demonstrated. And more security is a horrible DSL. It's a DSL. That's a good thing. The bad thing is it's horrible. It's so horrible that it makes my baby cry. So this is a rule from the core rule set of more security. It's a single line. Can you believe that? And there's a lot of you know, no line noises. And also to compromise the Apache configuration syntax, they made the, you know, the, the, the syntax of their WAF rule language very convoluted. 
and they also invented go-to-like things, and like skip, skip, right? And also they have tricks to make it possible to express if, else, if, else, because it's flat, right? Why not create a new language, right? Just like what we did here. It's clean. For example, down, the down keyword can be short, short circuit. So if the first rule matches, the second rule will be skipped, and, all, and so are all the subsequent rules. So it's, 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 it's essentially an if-else, right? It's more natural, and it doesn't require very crazy late, deep nesting of indentation, right? If you look at, like, VCL or some CDN business code, it's all like a decision tree, right? If else, if else, if else. Yes, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, okay, so speaking of the essential m models, like, like a theoretical models of different kinds of business systems, I can you know, get a model language, right? It's also quite general for data analytics business and for many microservices like Kong, Mashape's Kong, and Vue. Vue, we ha already have many templating languages, right? They are DSLs. And also, we have controller languages, we just shown that can be used to do very complicated dynamic routing and dispatching and even WAF for validations. Okay, so some, you know, sport games industry can use you know, sport language, their own business language, their own language to describe the business systems. How, how can that be even cooler, right? We, sh as, you know, as professionals in the software industry, we have no reason to force other industries, like physics, like math, like sport, like whatever, or even philosophy to use computer languages. That's a shame, right? Ideally, we should use the domain-specific languages, their domains, their languages, their talks, and let the machine do the hard work. And also, it opens a huge amount of possibilities for optimizations, because um, not every programmer knows how to optimize things and how to optimize things nicely, right? OK, my time's up, sorry. <laughs> and why language for generating you know, different debugging tools for different systems like GDB, like SystemTab, like Logit. And also, we can have CoffeeScript support, because CoffeeScript is very you know, popular, maybe, uh, a, a DSL or an overlay language that can generate client-side JavaScript. And we can also support a co compiler that can you know, compile CoffeeScript code into OpenRSD lower code. And we can also have a matter DSL. That's a, that's a DSL for creating all the DSLs, including self. We have a DSL specifically for creating you know, compilers, DSL compilers, optimizing compilers. It would be great. Pro is the best choice for me, but it's not the best. It's not the, not the best choice. We can create a, you know, a language specifically for compiler building and construction. So we can have clean separation between business representation and business implementation, which means that we can swap the underlying implementation overnight without touching even a single line of the business code. That would be crazy. For example, now we are running the business systems atop of RST. Maybe next day, we can migrate the backend to assembly code or C code to generate pure C implementation, right? and without touching the business specification. That can be huge. And migrating to a new technology stack in the future will not mean rewriting everything from scratch, but just writing, adding a new backend and optimizer in the existing DSL compiler, right? And also, we can have a brand new kinds of web application frameworks. It should be compiling style instead of, you know, adding up layers and layers and layers, which makes the whole thing running very slowly and clumsily, right? And we can achieve beauty and efficiency at the same time. That's, that is the only way that I can see after years of you know, business product engineering. And the best language is the business language, as we've already said. 
And one nice thing about you know business language, sorry about that, so is that once I create a DSL and I pour some business logic to that DSL, and I happen to find the original requirement document from the customer, and I compare them from side to side, by side by side, and found that they look so similar, and then I know I'm on the right track, right? So I think that there is a best way to describe a specific problem demand, right? So machine, if machine truly understands your business logic, it can do more than ever for you, like generating test cases, doing context-sensitive analysis, or even you know, generating a true runnable implementation for you on the fly. Uh, sorry, no time for questions. And you are welcome to you know, contact me offline either by Twitter or emails or whatever. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the delay.